service, ask the Lord to just allow you to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church as a corporate body and to you as an individual in the corporate body. Will you do that? Father, we thank you for this evening, for the opportunity to come into your presence. Lord, we commit ourselves to the word of the Lord, praying that your spirit, Lord, would direct us. Let us operate skillfully in our effort to to minister. I pray the blessings of the Most High would rest upon this body. Let joy come. Let power come. Let deliverance come. Lord, bring hope to this body. And direct us as we endeavor to accomplish what you've set before us. Receive our praise and our worship this evening. We rejoice that we are counted worthy to be in this holy place. And we pray the blessings of the Lord rich upon each and every one and upon their family. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, now one more time, lift your hands and your voices and let's praise him. Blessed is the Most High God, worthy to receive all glory, all honor, and all praise. Praise be the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you. You may be seated. We welcome those that are tuning in via multimedia and uh, those that have just tuned in uh, via multimedia. Our scripture text is Isaiah 54. We'll read some verses there, and then 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verses 11, 12, 13. Isaiah 54, reading some verses again, and 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 11, 12, and 13. Sing, O barren, Isaiah 54, verse 1. That thou didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left. And thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. For thy maker, verse 5, is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. And thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith the Lord. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment. But with the everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord, thy Redeemer. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And we will be reading verses 11, 12, and 13. O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you. Our heart is enlarged. Yet are not straightened in us. You are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. Verse 13. Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children. Be ye also enlarged. I want to talk to us this evening for that much time on the subject of expansion. Maturity, growth, prep. And I, I believe the scripture will bear uh, the text in a way that, that we can grasp it uh, and in a sense apply it, which is why initially I ask you to pray and ask the Lord to anoint your ear to hear what the Spirit 
saith unto the church. I want you to have insight. I want you to grasp understanding. Because I am convinced more today than I ever have been that there is a directive set down from on high that is specifically spoken to this church accompanying the entirety of the body of Christ. We use a lot of terminology that, that is common to us. And you know from time to time I point out things that uh, has been common to us and try to lend some extra context to it. Uh, the one that I don't believe is, requires that of me is, is the word revival. I think we have, have a pretty concise understanding of, of what that word means. And, and I would even dare say we've got good insight in how it applies to the present day. Uh, so I won't go into it to any great degree, say this. Revival begins with the body. Harvest accompanies revival. Revival begins with the individual, and the harvest comes in the aftermath of a reviving. And so when we use that term, evangelists come through, they may have a little different perspective, but uh, when, when that term is being used, it is applicable to the individual. And so my prayer is, revive me, O Lord, in anticipation of how I can be most effective. Revive me, O Lord, in anticipation of how I am not effective. I need to be effective with regard to the operation and the demonstration of the Spirit. I don't need to be too affected by this world. And in order that I can accomplish both, I need a personal reviving. And, and this probably doesn't apply to anybody but me, but I need one every day. And for that to take place, I need to position myself where I have a spiritual infilling. Fill my cup, the psalmist prayed, to running over. Therein lies the effect of fullness. That is the key to personal revival. It's not just to get to a level of spirituality that I'm comfortable so that I can be comfortable with the things that are gray in my area, in my life, I should say, but it lifts me to a place or fills me to the capacity that I can now reap a harvest. So my revival, though it fills me, with all due respect, its spillover has an effect or should have an effect on those that I come in contact with. Amen. My conversation should be revelatory. When people look upon my countenance, I want the countenance of a man in covenant with a king. I want my testimony to be, or perhaps better said, I want the assessment of who I am to be. And we looked upon him, and we took note that he's been with Jesus. Because that's what they said of the disciples, and they took note that they had been with Jesus. I personally believe that there is a facial demonstration, a kindness, a patience that coincides with my personal revival. And I've had people tell me, oh, I don't pray for patience. I'm too scared to pray for patience. And most of those folks, no criticism intended, just a the fact, they're about thimble deep. 
and they have very little to offer the kingdom. Well, Brother Lewis, when you say patience, isn't that a relevant term? It is. It really is. But what does the Scripture say concerning it? And then your patience possess ye your soul. The soul in the Hebrew we've already established and determined is the thoughts and the mind. So wherever your mind is, if your mind is impatient, if it's troubled constantly, it's going to be hard for you to get in the mind of Christ because you're going to be so overwhelmed with the here and the now until you're going to miss, in many instances, you'll miss privileges that the Holy Spirit affords you. That's why it is so important, saints of God, to bring every thought into captivity. Because when you bring every thought into captivity, you are practicing yet another principle, and that is the principle of self-control. Amen. So when we use the term in proper application, it begins with me. It tests me. It challenges me. It, it enlightens me. It reveals me. And it reveals to me a me that you may never see. Amen. Some of my greatest repentant prayers were prayed looking in a mirror. Because prior to that, prior to that reflection, I did not realize that maybe there were some things I needed to work on. But when you really look at yourself, knowing that you're the only one anywhere that can never truly see your face, yet knowing also that in that reflection, it can be telling. I want to present a united front. Amen. A truly united front. Well, Brother Lewis, that's between you and your wife. If y'all work together in tandem, you have a united front. It can apply, as you well know, in so many areas. But what I'm speaking of now is I want to unite with him so that I have a united front. Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. If I, am in, if I am united with him and we become one, now I can rejoice in the fact that I have the mind of Christ. Now the assessments that I make, the evaluations that I make, yes, the judgments that I make are not my own but they are the Spirit of Christ working in me and working through me. It seems to me that I'm going to make better decisions if I'm operating in a dimension of the mind of Christ than I am if I'm just operating in my own thoughts. Because my own thoughts are going to be greatly influenced by my emotions. If it makes me feel good, if it doesn't, and, and my emotions can become extremely influential in how I present myself. As a praiser, it can have an influence on my praise. Because my praise is not limited, nor is yours, limited to what we do in here. If it is, you misunderstood praise. Your worship is not confined to the events that transpire in these four walls or even on this campus and across this plant. That's a portion of, but our praise is let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. So our praise is manifest in our willingness to draw life into our body. If I draw life into my body, my actions should be a praise as I exhale that life. Brother Lewis, do you walk around saying praise the Lord all the time? Well, quite frankly, if you're around me very often, you're going to hear a lot of that. But that's not what I'm talking about. When I draw life into my body, my presentation should glorify him. My action should glorify him. The way I converse with people should glorify him. The way I, my countenance should glorify him. 
Unhappy people need Jesus desperately. Griping, griping, grouchy people need Jesus desperately. Negative people need some Jesus. Believe you me, they need some Jesus. Why? Because he either transforms us or he gives us an opportunity to reserve a little bit for ourselves. That is not the way this works. In the day you serve me with your whole heart. That's what the Bible teaches us. In that day, he said, I will be a God unto you and you will be a people unto me. Not just a people, but you'll be a people unto me. So what you do matters. How you do it matters. I watched an interesting unfolding. If you've dro- driven by the office area of the building, Brother Bruce is here now, uh, we have replaced some windows in the office area. Incidentally, I have a story about that. I'm setting roadside. Our dear Bishop Mangan has just been in an accident. I'm holding hand, his hand. I'm with Sister Mangan. We're just in sight of the campground this past week. And during that, I get a call. An interesting call. I answer the phone. It's Brother Eddie Hanks. Brother Lewis, I don't know if you know it or not, but they just put a sliding glass door where your window was. I said, whoa. He said, I I don't want to be the bearer of bad tidings, he said, but it's kind of looking like a trailer house over there. I said, oh. He said, now... I see them over there working. Do you want me to stop them? I said, Eddie, I can't even believe you call me. You know I want them to stop. I don't want a sliding glass window or door where my window was. And he dies laughing. He said, I couldn't wait to tell Tish I was going to call Brother Lewis and tell him they put a sliding glass door where his window was. So, In that respect, considering all things and understanding the importance of this, we have to capture the uniqueness and the witness of apostolic purpose. Now, for those of you that are wondering, you're welcome to go by my office. I have a beautiful window in my office. That just happens to match Pastor Chance's window in his office. And Brother Bruce did an exceptional job. But I walked in there, and I realized that Brother Bruce left me a job, which is really not my job. It's going to be somebody's job. Somebody's got to get a paintbrush now. And it's not that I'm above that. It's just that I'm not very good at that. So, For completion's sake, we're going to have to put a little bit of paint on the wall. When it comes to our spirituality, it requires a little extra from time to time if we're going to present beautifully in the sight of the Lord. And we talked about this quite often, and all of us desire a harvest. I desire a harvest. We believe God's going to grant us a harvest. But for us to have this harvest... We're going to have to get in the flow so that we can be the cistern that can be the overflow. Now, let's look at our text. In Isaiah 54, actually, we probably should have read through verse 10. Maybe you'll do that in your private study. But we read these verses. In this salvation oracle, the Lord promises Zion. That he has not forsaken her, but he will give her many offspring. In verses 1 through 3, Zion is represented as a barren woman who gives birth to numerous children. In verses 4 through 10, 
Zion is a forsaken wife who receives an eternal covenant of peace. Let's look at verse 1. The first command that God issues with regard to Zion was for her to sing. And this is literally and actually a running theme. You can see it in Isaiah 12 and 6, Isaiah 44, 23, Isaiah 49, 13. It is a running theme that we are to sing. So it seems that coupled with production is a song. Now we often refer to the song of the redeemed. We remind our congregation often, many preachers come through, I do it. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. The word of your testimony is the song of Zion. And what is so unique about the song of Zion, or perhaps we could make it the songs of Zion. What are unique about the songs of Zion is that this is a chorus or choruses that the angels of the Lord themselves cannot sing. Now, I don't understand how God put all this together. I don't understand why he allows me of the fallen nature, redeemed by the blood, to sing the song of angels. When the created beings of worship are not allowed to sing the song of the redeemed. I'm going to tell you, we talk often about the fact that the angels, the salvation that we speak of, the angels desire to look into. Let me tell you who most would like to look into this. It's Satan himself. He would like to know more about this redeeming love. He would like to know more about reconciliation and restoration, things that we preach constantly, things that almost become second nature to us. Satan himself would really like to think, I believe, he would really like to think he had a second chance. The first introduction to the second chance is the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy means literally the opportunity of the second chance, which is why when you read Deuteronomy, it's basically... uh, 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 the cliff notes uh, of, of the prior law and requirements because now a new generation is not only in a position to accept law, but it's a new generation that is ready to accept promise. Can I teach here a little bit, preach here just a little bit? It has nothing to do with my lesson, but I feel something. A lot of what we have done for many years has to do with the original. But an entire generation would see promise but would never receive promise. An entire generation annually would pass by and could glimpse promise but would never be recipients of promise. An entire generation died in the wilderness until God brought a people to the brink of Jordan that had the courage and the impetus to claim promise. A lot of religion can be found on the east side of, or on the east bank of Jordan. A lot of religion can be found there. But promise is on the other side. There's a lot of denominations that do not believe in the essentiality of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Some have alluded to, and perhaps even some of the hymns of old seem to imply that that the crossing of Jordan was the crossing over into the heaven of heavens. That is not what that references. The crossing of Jordan was crossing over into the promised land. The crossing of Jordan is akin to and likened to the baptism of the Holy Spirit when we step from religion into promise. Well, Brother Lewis, you'll have to prove that by Scripture. I promise you, brothers and sisters, take my word for it. When you get to heaven, you don't have to face a Jericho. You're not going to have to go on a seven-day sojourn or march to make a wall fall. But when you come into the promise of the Holy Spirit, yes, you're going to have to face some Jerichos. And if you're not careful, you may have success at the first fruit, which belonged to God. But because of a failing or a sin, 
lose confidence at Ai. You understand the, the implication, right? Walls fall at Jericho, one of the largest and heavily populated cities of promise. Ai is just a small little barrio where thousands of Israelites died. Why? Because even in promise, you still have to deal with the sin issue. Even in promise, you still have to understand the premium of repentance. A wedge of gold and a Babylonian garment doesn't seem like much to me, but it was a lot to God. Why? Because, was it Achan? Achan took something that was the first fruit. And brothers and sisters, understand this. If you don't get anything else tonight, the first fruit belongs to God. Well, I pay my tithes. I'm not talking about just your tithes. That's important. It really is. And I hope you do have your finances in proper alignment with Holy Scripture. But the first fruit of your day, if you give the first fruit of your day to the Lord, you won't have to worry about what happens at Ai. Ai will be an afterthought if you give your first fruits. When your feet hit the floor, the first words out of your mouth is, Great is the Lord. And the next words are, and greatly to be praised. Why? Because when your feet hit the floor and that breath you draw is the life of the Lord. And not only are you alive, but by the baptism of transformation, you are living an abundant life, which is extraordinary. And so because of that, we sing. This is a barren woman. It's representing barrenness. And yet God commands her to sing. I want you to notice something. I've never really grasped this until my study and preparation actually today. The next verse, or in that verse it says, you have not labored with child. And yet all these promises of expansion and growth and, and birth, and I wondered why. I've never known. I, we've had two children, and I went in, and, and wow. Someone said, thankfully, it's not ever going to happen in the, the world that's trying to convince us it will. It's not going to happen. But somebody told me that if mom had the first baby, dad had the second baby, mom had the third baby, there would never be a fourth child. Believe you me, I went in there, mom had the first one, and there never would have been a second one if she hadn't had it. The judgment on birth was that it would be with pain and sorrow, and yet, or suffering, I should say, and yet the writer said, the prophecy is you have not labored with child. And here's why. Because Cyrus, by prophetic utterance, Coming out of Babylonian captivity, Cyrus returned the exiles without any pressure from the Israelites. He was named in prophecy that he would release them out of exile. Thus, they were released. There was no labor. It was a release. Interesting parallel as far as I'm concerned. And yet, it's a perfect parallel. There are things that are in the womb of the church that can be born spiritually that may not require the suffering and the pain you think it's going to require. And because of that, you can engage it. Brother Lewis, I thought this was going to cost me everything. It does. It'll cost you your everything, but it in turn gives you his everything. 
I have to prove that by scripture. I wouldn't have said it if I couldn't. Fear not, little flock. For it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You know what the kingdom is, right? It's the king's domain. It's the promise. For the promise is unto you. We think somehow it's enough to sing, I've got it. Y'all remember when we sang that? That's not our song. Certainly should be our testimony. But our song is we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And we've been sanctified, which means, and I know we don't like this word, separated or set apart for the service of the kingdom. That we can present ourselves. We like royalty. We're kind of we're kind of on the cusp of peculiar, but holy. Ah, really? Do we have to use that terminology? For you are a royal priesthood. A holy nation. The governance. Nation means governance. Priesthood is spiritual connection to law. Nation means governance. We are governed by the holiness of God. That's why you ought to have a few convictions in your world. Unless you're walking perfect before the Lord. And I tip my hat to you if you are. Don't worry, you'll never have to tip your hat to me because I'm not. But if in governance we are committed to the ways of Christ, we are not just a nation, we are a holy nation. And yes, I know we don't particularly like this terminology, but we really are a peculiar people. That's what? I hear a certain sound. I'm in my wilderness experience, but there's promise awaiting me, and I hear a certain sound. What is that sound? That's the call of God. We've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Something has birthed here. Verse 2, and I'm, I'm going to rush through this quickly. Verse 2 is indicative of, as a husband encourages his wife, the Lord, here is the encourager to Zion, the mother of his people. Now watch this. I've heard this preached. It doesn't mean I've got the only revelation, but I feel like I've got a revelation. And if you want to test my revelation, you can read Isaiah 49, 19 and 20. Which I guess, having said that, I finally got Isaiah's revelation. To enlarge the family tent. I've heard preached in larger tents. This was to enlarge the family tent. For her many children. There is a spiritual word to the body. And that word is prep or preparation. With all of the hurt and the angst and the frustration and, and, and all of the things that materialize seemingly out of nowhere through, through COVID and, and so many other influencers, through, through the, the, the rise and fall of, of, uh, of the, the um, Dow and, and, and all of that stuff, and, and it's just that, it's, it's stuff, through all of that, we have the testimony that we're still here. 
And frankly, brothers and sisters, it's no accident that, that you are still here. This is by divine order that you are still here. That we are still here. Make no mistake, the death angel may visit my home this evening, and I may not be here tomorrow. But I am here now. And as being here now, I am here as a son of promise. But I am also here as a son who is prompted through obedience to hear the word of the Lord. Can I be critical? This is not a time to settle on your leaves. This is not a time to let fear dictate your comings and goings. This is not the time for you to say, I've done enough. It is not that time. We haven't gotten there yet, but we are on our way. And it could happen in the next moment. Jesus Christ could come back after the church. I am a student of the word. I don't have great insight into the revelation. I just trust Jesus that he's coming back in his time. And I trust him when he said no man knoweth the time or the hour. He's just going to come back. But when he does, I want to be ready and I want to get out of here. But I must occupy until he comes. If I am the, the body, if I am a part of the body, and frankly, I don't care what part I am. I just want to be a part of the body. I'm not sure what vessel I am in the great house. I just want to be an honorable vessel. I'm not sure how I fit in the greater scheme of the plan, master plan of God. But I do know this, I want to be saved. And if I'm functioning, whatever part of the body, whether I'm an appendage, whatever my, my, my call and my role may be in this, in my birthing, I want to have the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ in this earth, in my most humble opinion, should be the actions of the body of Christ in this earth. What did Jesus say? I must be about my father's business. I cannot be distracted with otherness. I must be about my father's business. I'm birthed into this. I'm one of the sons of expansion. You are a son or a daughter of expansion. There's not too many here. Maybe you have a little Jewish blood in you. But there are not many among us, if any, that can boast of Jewish blood pure and, 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 and being a son in law. But we are a son in new birth. And because we are a son in new birth, by his grace and his mercy, he has engrafted us into the original vine. So the world may see us as a hybrid, and frankly, I don't care how they see us. I don't think we would be considered hybrids if we were engrafted into the original vine. So I believe that what God is speaking through the prophet to Zion has a bearing on the church today. And what he's saying, while they're in exile, you're going to come out of exile. And when you come out of exile, you don't have the labor pains. You have the blessing. Because I brought judgment that brought the labor pains. But I'm engaging you in a covenant of expansion. Now, brothers and sisters, we do not have to act in self-abuse to operate in promise. Hurt me, preacher. Beat me to death. Kick me in the seat of my britches. Rough me up. 
you know what? You just need to have a prayer meeting and have a relationship with Jesus so that the Spirit of God can speak to you and ultimately, through you, now my cup is it's running over. Verse 3, expand is an allusion to Genesis chapter 28 and verse 14 where the same Hebrew word is translated spread abroad. There was no fallacy. The words were not misleading. These words were born in pain and suffering. When Job proclaimed his righteousness, he was speaking exactly the assessment of God himself concerning him. And yet, his friends, I love my friends, but I have to admit, I might have had a falling out with some of my friends if my friends was like Job's friends. For one thing, I can't stand this. As a matter of fact, they, they get me. It was a Wednesday night a couple, few years back, and we had a program plan and I was back then we were sitting on the platform and and it, it got time it, I was watch it was time and there was nothing happening as a matter of fact what I thought was time my watch was actually five minutes fast and sister Karen was walking through the back door when I took the pulpit and by her own admission I was scared to death because I believe in starting on time. Now, I don't believe in finishing on time, but I do believe in starting on time. And she said, and I quote, I looked at my watch and said, oh, my God, it's only five till. And she made a break for the platform. And I didn't need her on the platform because I've already read my text. I'm about to prove a point. You're going to start on time or we'll do it without the music. I'll just preach. Now, that was my presentation based on a watch that was five minutes fast. And no, I have no problem apologizing. That is not one of my weaknesses. I will apologize. If I'm wrong, I will apologize. If I'm right, I will receive an apology. Because the Bible said it's more blessed to receive than give. <laughs> oh, it, it didn't really say that's true. So we have a meeting following that, and Chance, bless his heart, Pastor Chance looked at me and he said, Dad, what were you thinking? I said, Son, I looked out over the congregation and they were looking at me. I felt like we ought to be doing something. That was five minutes. Job's friend stared at him for seven days. I ain't sure I could have put up with that. But they did. And then when they started in on him, my goodness, you would have thought they was a bunch of old bell cow Pentecostals because they were lowering the boom on him. They were judging everything about him. They had no facts whatsoever. Everything was speculation at best and personal opinion. Saints of God, be careful how you impose personal opinion on people. You may miss it. You may offend. And don't walk around here telling me, if you intentionally offend somebody, don't walk around here complaining because they have the spirit of offense. You need to go ask them to forgive you. Oh, they, got, they just have the spirit of offense. No, you need to get a grip. Wow, that didn't come out, did it? That was like running around in my brain. I never intended for that to come out of my mouth. However, it's good anyway. Spread abroad. 
expand. So how do we measure this? Why is it so important for spiritual maturity? Why is spiritual growth so important? Because the church is mandated to increase anticipating the necessity of enlargement. We need spiritual men and women who are ready at a moment's notice to step into the OB war. And I alluded to it earlier, the OB ward is not a pleasant, clean place. When Zion travailed, sons and daughters were brought forth. Babies have to be birthed, cleaned. Now, a lot of folks get in on that cleaning part. They kind of like that part. But you haven't done it all when we just see it birthed and cleaned and set aside. At some point, it's got to be fed. And I know y'all don't want to hear this, but babies make messes. Now, mine didn't, but I'm sure y'all's did. And babies cry at the most inopportune times. Not mine. They were perfect. But yours did. Anybody ever heard the word colic? Anybody ever heard the word teething? How about some of these infections that seem to find their way to the bodies of our children? There's been a time or two when Gabe brought them and dropped them in my lap, and I said, Gabe, you reckon we can give them back? They're really becoming a lot of trouble here. She got a wild idea to start keeping our grands, all five of them, when they were all just, all of them infants, well, actually four. Zeb hadn't, wasn't born at this time. So that mom and dad could go out and enjoy an evening on a Friday evening. I'll never forget it. Uh, we had a men's work day scheduled for the following Saturday. My mother and father-in-law were visiting in our home at the time, and all four kids were there, and they were really perfect children. They were sitting, putting puzzles together, and um, singing gospel songs. They were, they were, they were, weren't making messes. They were just, they only eat the things that we put before them. They didn't ask for anything that we didn't have. They were just being like Zale, just like their grandfather, perfect, which I thought was pretty cool. As a matter of fact, as they were doing this, I told Gad, I said, why don't we just keep them every night? And then I woke up. At 10 o'clock, I had four of the most active children known to the human race. My father-in-law and I, we had visited, and I decided since I had to be at men's work day at 7, I probably needed to go to bed, which I did. I closed my door. I attempted to lock my door, but it didn't have a lock on it. The thought of sticking a chair under the door had occurred to me, but I wanted to save my marriage, so I didn't do that. Now, I don't know, Brother Kevin has traveled with me. Brother Ron has traveled with me. I do not have a guilty conscience. They timed me in Alaska. Brother Jay Williams has traveled with me. They timed me in Alaska 13 seconds from the time my head hit the pillow till I snored the first time. They asked me what that was all about, and I said, good, clean living. So sometime at... At, at about 10, oh, one and a half, I'm very much asleep. I will never forget this. My wife will never forget this. My mother-in-law will never forget this. My father-in-law has already gone on to his just reward. He's talking about it on that side. Thereby, my wife busts through the door. Zell, get up. Oh, my goodness. Why? Three o'clock in the morning. You've got to help me with these kids. 
I said, okay. What you need me to do? Well, you got to get in here and help us get them to bed. I said, oh, no, I don't do that. That's not in my wheelhouse. I said, but I will, I will get the manual out, and I'll tell you how to, how to take care of this. And she said, okay. What do you think we need to do? I said, just give me a moment. I'll be right back. I had to make a show. So I went back in the room. I waited a little while. I came back out. I said, according to the manual, grandkids are to be loved and sent home. Call their parents and tell them to come get them. We've loved them. Now send them home. No, Wendy, she didn't do that. But she did bring in the daylight with them. And I came on to men's work day. It takes patience to raise babies. And for a period of time, it takes milk, the sincere milk of the Word. It's interesting, Peter and Paul never really, they never really clicked. They were brethren and they were apostles, but they really had some, some differing ideas. As a matter of fact, so much so that Peter said, Paul's writings are, are, are hard and not everyone can understand them. So Peter talks primarily to the Hebrew church and he said, desire the sincere milk of the word. Paul, on the other hand, is dealing with you and I, the Gentile church. And Paul said, I've been giving you milk, and the reason I've been giving you milk is because you can't digest meat. Why? Because you came to a level of growth and stalled. And that's as far as you've been able to go. I can't get you any further than that. I need to be giving you meat, but you're just not capable of handling the meat. Brothers and sisters, I speak to the last day church we, we can rejoice in the sweet taste of the sincere milk of the word. But if we're going to get nourishment and strength to have revival and a harvest that God ordained, we're going to have to learn how to chew the meat. Some of you have learned how to chew the fat. But that don't even belong to you. Well, Lewis, I can chew the fat with anybody. That's what everybody says about me. You can talk to anybody. I can But the fat doesn't belong to the body. The Bible says the fat belongs to the Lord. The fat is what produces the incense that ascends into the high place. It's the lean meat of the word that gives the church nourishment so that we can birth. Does this make any sense? So we can birth. So you cannot apply one principle and be negligent with the other. So Paul says, as an apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he, he, he refers to himself a, a, as the apostle and the apostles. He says, and I quote, O you Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Verse 12, ye are not straightened in, the, in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. Now for a recompense in the same, and there's a parenthetical, I speak unto you as my children. Please look at this. There's a parenthetical there. He says he qualifies what he's communicating and to whom he's communicating. I speak to you as my children. If they're his children, he's birthed them through the apostolic message. He's birthed them through the preaching of the gospel. He's birthed them through patience. And he said, I'm speaking to you now because you're mine. And what do you have to say to us, Paul? Be ye also enlarged. I want you to be like me. I want you to be able to do what I've done. The King James Version of this same scripture where the word enlarged is written there, he said, be open. So whatever translation you lean toward, broaden your horizons or be open. And I guess what I'm trying to say to us is this. We need to be open, not to the generalization of the things of God, but we need to be open to the things of God, not just for personal benefit, 
but for kingdom purpose. I don't preach for my benefit. I preach for kingdom purpose. Brother Randy Brown teaches with my wife. He doesn't do that to teach himself. He does it for kingdom purpose. How can he teach for kingdom purpose? By preparing himself to communicate what the Spirit says to him. By gleaning from the pages of Holy Writ and fellowshipping the truths of God so that they're not just personal to him, but that he can overflow. Brother Ron, Brother Kevin, Don't strap the tool belts on in South Central America, Brother brother Jim. For themselves, there's an orphanage that needs dormitories. And so these brethren strap their tool belts on because they're providing a service. They're providing an opportunity. They're providing... Structure and shelter. Not for themselves. With the exception of maybe Brother Ron, none of us have spent the night in our dormitory. I didn't need a bed in Guatemala. But there's some little children who I may never meet on this side of glory that did. And so we invest time and we invest effort and we invest finances. What? For the greater purpose. We're birthing something that will have lasting value. I hear people talking about their legacy. You know what my legacy, what I desire my legacy to be? I desire my legacy to be he wasn't hard to preach his funeral. That's good enough for me on this side of glory. I want to live my life where they don't have to get up and lie. Now, I've lined some preachers up that if I need them to, they probably will do it for me. But I sure don't want to put them in that straight. I want to be able to say good things about me. And it be true. Amen. I'm of the opinion if they can truthfully say good things about me and it's true, that's a good thing for me because I'm going to be over there. But if the Lord lets me, I'm going to watch, I'm going to look in. Here's the reason why I'm going to look in. I'm going to tell you all now. I'm going on record. This is not the first time I've done this. As a matter of fact, anybody that listened to me, I've gone on record. I don't want no rejoicing at my funeral. Oh, Brother Lewis, I want people to rejoice at my funeral. I don't want no rejoicing. Everybody better be crying at my funeral. Whether you mean to or not, you better be crying. You better act like you miss me. And if I find out, if the Lord does give me an opportunity to peep in and I find out you didn't, I'm going to be waiting on you at the pearly gates. You ain't going to see St. Peter there. I'm going to be standing there waiting on you. Well, Brother Lewis, you better live your life. That's exactly right. I need to live my life where those that are left behind me will miss me. I I have to tell my wife every day, you're going to miss me when I'm gone. I shouldn't have to tell her that every day. Somebody even wrote a song, and I sing it. I hope it's not sinful because I only know one line. It's, you're going to miss me when I'm gone. Now, if y'all go and find out that the lyrics of that thing is vile, don't come tell me. It'll break my heart because my wife hears it nearly every day. Two things she hears nearly every day. I tell her every morning when you get up, you should sing, I am blessed. And before we go to bed, I said, you're going to miss me when I'm gone. I believe we should leave our mark. Because promise is not only unto you, but it's to your children. It's to your downline. 
It's to your offspring. And it's not even confined to that alone. It's also to whosoever will. So when we talk in this terminology, when we use the term revival, let us understand the impact and the importance of it. But let us further recognize the part and the role we play in it. Brother Lewis, we have an evangelist coming in. We have church every night. I know, right? And we've had some that come, their gifting is prophecy. We've had some that come, and their gifting is teaching and instruction. I, I, I'm looking forward. I'm not like, like some of you because it's kind of a weighty cliche to me. I can't wait till. I, I can wait. I don't want to rush my life. My mother always said, you're wishing your life away. But I am excited about Champions Week. We're one of the greatest communicators and teachers and instructors of Bible that I've ever heard. Even in his youth, this man is phenomenal. And we've heard him, and, and we're anticipating that. We just had Brother Ferris, who is, is a faith builder. Did y'all see the picture of him we got? They're holding it till next year when he comes. They caught it perfect. I mean, he was just like this, and they nailed it. We've got a harvester coming in October. This guy has prayed. I've been, I've been following his ministry. He's been in San Antonio at uh, uh, Hope Center for, for months now. They've had hundreds of people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He's amazing. He's an amazing harvester. He's coming. We're going to have varying ministries that are going to fill our pulpit, and they're going to bring their giftings, and they're going to make their calling and election sure in the company of this body of believers, and I, I rejoice in that. But brothers and sisters, that's not revival. Revival is when you and I get revived so that we can birth some things spiritually in anticipation, positioning ourselves in promise so that we can fulfill destiny, our destiny. Your destiny, my destiny, our destiny, so that we can sing, it's joy unspeakable and full of his glory. Not my glory, not your glory, but it's joy unspeakable and it's full of his glory. The glory of the Lord coming down and kissing the praise of First Church de Ritter. The glory of the Lord coming down and kissing the true worship of the saints of God, the glory of the Lord coming down and blessing us through song and musical instruments uh, and words of testimony and words of prophecy and tongues and interpretation and the gifts of the Spirit in operation. We had tongues and interpretation go out. I've never had such a mystery in my life. I had text after text after text. Does anybody know who gave the tongues the interpretation of the tongues? I don't look around to see who's Checking in and who's checking out? I found out it's a young man that, that, that visits us quite often, I assume. He's never come to me and made an official commitment to the church, but he visits in and out. But you know what I've come to understand? Uh, these principal players that we're so confident in, God's going to raise up people that may not fit our ideology. It may not fit the way we have always done it. Uh, but let God be God. Uh, let God do what God does. Uh, let's let him operate in the body of Christ. Uh, if he doesn't use you and he's been using you, rejoice that he's using somebody else. Don't go in the corner somewhere and pout because you didn't get used. Uh, if he's not calling on you in this time, he's going to call on you at some time. Just be patient. Just know it's going to happen. And be ready to move at a moment's notice. Don't work so hard with your argument that you miss your opportunity. Brothers, I just can't be there because blank, 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 blank. That's just not my calling. It's not my. Don't be so quick to present your argument that you miss the glorious opportunity that the Spirit of God has entrusted you with. That's some wow and some heavy there. But so many do. I've worked tirelessly to get me an argument. I just, I seen it in pastor's eyes. I knew he was going to come to me, and I knew he was going to ask me to do something, but I was ready. And you know what? You got a pretty easy pastor. I'll let you off the hook. You really do. 
I'm not going to I'm not going to waste a lot of time with you if you say no it's no God will raise up somebody else to do it but now God may have a different opinion about it and God may use certain things to get your attention he used my daughter to get mine he's used my children on more than one occasion to arrest my attention and bring me back to clarity of, of sight and understanding. He's brought some things into my life that made me pray. But the beautiful word, the operative word of spiritual revelation and demonstration is through. He's never put me in a place that he hasn't brought me through thus far. Never has he put me in a place that he hasn't brought me through thus far. I'm almost 60 years old, and that's my testimony. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, because I have that testimony, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The rod is a type of the Holy Ghost. The staff is a type of instruction. They comfort me. God doesn't come to beat you up with his rod or with the staff. God comes to give you a comforter in the times of discomfort to bring peace and tranquility and give you clarity of thought so you can put a perspective on what you're wrestling with and understand uh, the wonders of Christ in you. And God can use that to produce a testimony. I think we say it something like this, and I'm closing. He can make your test your testimony or your mess your message. That's just the way God is. You can birth things in your spirit through beautiful, beautiful spiritual maturity. And I'm not a heavy on how long it's been. I know that, and you know that. But I do want to ask you, how long has it been since you had a praying through? Where your prayer led you into another realm of the spirit where you spoke a language that was of the world, where you declared yourself submissive and obedient to the word of the Lord because that is the language of the absolute. I want to share a quote with you. It was in my notes. I didn't get that far along, but I think I can find it quickly. And if I'm wearing on your time, forgive me. Okay, I know it's here. I got a lot of information here. I got a lot I didn't touch on, too. Wow. I got a little time? Okay, I'm not going to share that quote with you because I can't find it, and I know some of y'all are looking at me like, why doesn't he let us go? For heaven's sake, I mean, I got to get home. You're probably going straight to bed, too, when you get home. And I know that, so I'm keeping you from your bedtime. Wow, I know it was a good quote, too. I may not have even written it down. Shame on me. <laughs> Trust me, it was really good. Now, when I use it, and I'll find another context to put it in. I promise you, it was that good. <laughs> I'll have a preach on tithes and use it. It was really that good. <laughs> Let us stand together. As uncomfortable as this is, reach over and take the hand of the person standing beside you. And look at them and say, let's go to heaven together. Don't let go of that hand just yet. Don't let go of that hand just yet. Look at that individual and say, but until he comes, let's be about the Father's business. Let's lift our voices in blessing right now. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Father, we exalt your name on high. We rejoice in the witness of Christ in us, the testimony of the redeemed, the fellowship of divine peace. I pray the yoke broken off of us.